All right, hello and welcome to my second episode of True Crime Astrology. So my name is Shayna. I'm an astrologer and tarot reader. And basically in this series, I take a prolific figure in true crime and I compare their crimes to their birth charts. And I'm sure if you're somebody who's into true crime and also into astrology, when you watch a documentary about somebody, you also look up their birth chart and analyze it the whole time while you're watching this series. So basically that's what I'm doing for you. And this True Crime Astrology episode today Day is obviously about Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker. So before I go any further, let me just get the advertising out of the way. Okay, so I sell birth chart readings, I have a astrology TikTok, and I have a personal Instagram, but let's move on. So there obviously needs to be quite a few disclaimers whenever I do these videos. So the first thing is obviously I can't talk about everything. I can't bring up every, you know, little nuance. I'm obviously going to miss a lot of stuff. And I would honestly love it if you brought anything that I missed to my and others' attentions in the comments, and you can let me know any thoughts that you might have. Also. Just a big content warning. Obviously, this is about true crime. And I will be talking about all the usual, you know, triggers. I will be saying all this stuff. So if you're sensitive to any of those things, um, I would just skip this video and skip the series and watch something else. Also, the last disclaimer I really would like to emphasize is that just because I say that, oh, you know, Richard Ramirez has this specific aspect in astrology, whatever it might be, and I might link it or connect it to maybe some you know, deemed bad habit that he has. That doesn't mean that if you have this aspect or you know somebody that has it, that they will have this bad habit or blah, blah, blah. It's always a combination of stuff and there's always nature versus nurture. And don't think that I'm accusing you of something. Don't freak out in the comments or whatever it might be. Um, I mean, you can, but I'm just gonna think it's funny. The last little thing I wanna say before we dive headfirst into this video, which if you do not care about my life, if you do not care about me and you just wanna know about serial killers birth charts, I totally understand you can skip ahead. Um, but if you might notice, my background has changed again. Um, I've moved again just after I even made that Progress Sagittarius Moon video where I was like, my moon went into Capricorn. I feel stable at this place. I think I'll be here for a while. Bloody la di la. Nope, I had to move again. And that is why there is this awful cutoff of this blue wall. Um, I didn't pick it. I didn't paint it. It's what it is. Honestly, I'm much happier where I am now, but it was very dramatic. This old man wound up threatening my dog, Pixie. It's a whole thing. One of the other roommates has a restraining order against him now, um, but whatever. Um, we move past it. I'm hopefully safe here. We'll find out. I'll let you know in a few months if I move again. But for now, here's the new background. Please ignore the blue. There's nothing I can do about it, and it really does bother me. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> A brief overview of Richard Ramirez, aka the Night Stalker. If you know nothing about him, Richard Ramirez was an American serial killer, burglar, and rapist who murdered at least 13 people in California between the years 1984 to 1985. And if you're interested in his birth chart information, he was born on February 28th, 1960 at 2.07 a.m. in El Paso, Texas. And this does have an AA rating, which basically means that his birth chart information comes directly from his birth certificate. So it's as accurate as we can humanly get. Here is his birth chart. His big three is a Sagittarius rising, Pisces sun, Pisces moon. The very first thing I would like to point out is that he is triple mutable. And if you don't know, um, there is an infamous thing where almost all serial killers are mutable sun signs. But as I do this true crime astrology series, we will both find out together that um, it's more than just the sun sign that winds up being mutable. There's major influence of mutability amongst the whole chart. Like for example, the last one I did was Ted Kaczynski and he had a fat ass Gemini stellium. He was a Gemini rising and a Gemini sun amongst a bunch of other planets in Gemini. Already we have this Pisces sun, Pisces moon, Pisces mercury mutability with Richard Ramirez and even his Sagittarius rising and Sagittarius Jupiter in the first house, both adding even more mutability to his chart. So I chose Richard Ramirez to do next because I feel very differently about him than I feel about Ted Kaczynski. If if you didn't watch that video, I have a great admiration and, and somewhat respect for Ted Kaczynski, at least his mind and his manifesto, and I find him really interesting. Now, Richard Ramirez, I see as the exact opposite end of the spectrum to Ted Kaczynski, which I'm realizing that they have that like Gemini Sagittarius polarity. Um, Ted Kaczynski is a Gemini rising and Richard Ramirez is a Sagittarius rising. Richard Ramirez, I see as, <laughs> I would coin him the serial killer's serial killer. It's just like, that's all he is. That's all he was kind of meant to be. That's all he kind of ever was. 
he doesn't really have much more intricacy or personality. He didn't have that double life that a lot of serial killers have. He was just always <laughs> this person, um, which let's go into his early life. So as mentioned, he was born in El Paso, Texas to a working class family and he was the youngest of five siblings. As I mentioned in the previous video, I always like to look for where is the concentration of planets in somebody's birth chart because that can sometimes tell a little bit more into the class that they were born into. For example, you see in Richard Ramirez's chart, he has this concentration of energy in houses 12 through four. It's not the only energy he has, but it is the concentrated area and he is from a you know more working class lower class family also the fact that he is the baby of the family the youngest of five i usually find that the oldest child and the youngest child in a big sibling batch <laughs> Um, I usually find that they have some strong Saturnian influence. Um, it shows up differently, but you'll see in Richard Ramirez's chart, he has a Saturn in Capricorn, which is its home sign in the first house, um, an angular house. Also with this Sun, Moon, and Mercury all in Pisces, I see this a lot of times as being the quote unquote baby of the family. With all this Pisces energy, it's like you want to stay in the womb for a very long time. Um, and so it's almost like you don't want to get out of that safety net you want to be taken care of you want to be protected so it makes sense that he's the youngest in the family with all this Pisces energy going on also there is a lot of mention of him being neglected a lot as a child which Pisces does rule neglect he also has a strong Neptune with it aspecting most planets and it even being involved with a grand trine within his Lilith and his Sun which I'll mention later also this Sun Moon and Mercury in Pisces you know sort of baby energy it's in the third house of Sibylla siblings. So that even emphasizes it even more that the, he had a lot of siblings. He was the youngest of five. There's literally a lot of planets in the third house, which I find like, for example, um, India's chart has um, a lot of planets, a packed third house, and they literally have packed roads, um, which is what the third house rules. There's a lot of people driving on the roads and, you know, walking on the roads at all times. So it makes sense that he has quite a bit of energy in his third house, and he has quite a few siblings. Now, alongside with the neglect that was mentioned, it was said that his parents were gone a lot. They were both working a lot. Um, and so this makes sense because he has this fourth house in Aries. There's something that I watched that it literally stated that he had to sort of fend for himself while growing up. He had to figure things out, probably had to figure out his own food. There probably weren't a lot of meals being made for him, probably not a lot of care being taken towards him. Again, all that Pisces influence, as well as that fourth house Aries kind of having to stand alone, having to stand up for yourself. He came from a Mexican immigrant family. So that means that he was a first generation. That makes sense that he has Pluto in the ninth house and being a first generation American, there was some sort of big change that happened within his family life, you know, his parent parental life that made them move countries. And so this sort of cultural difference, even though he was born in America, there's obviously still some sort of root ancestral difference, which will also show up in that Uranus in the eighth house that is intercepted as well. I think this shows that sort of displacement that comes from um, being a first generation American. Now it obviously shows up differently in everybody's chart, but I think that's kind of how it shows up in his. What's also interesting is that when his dad lived in Mexico. He was a policeman. But when his dad actually moved to America, he became a railway worker, um, which has so much to do with all that third house energy that um, Richard Ramirez has, especially literally his son in the third house. So there's this forever question, are serial killers born or created? And astrology, I think, says that both are true. I think astrology also points out that both nature and nurture are also both simultaneously true. A big thing that people point towards um, with serial killers is abuse early in the childhood. And Richard Ramirez was definitely not short of that. His father was an alcoholic and he was prone to major, major fits of rage and anger and heavy abuse, lots of physical abuse on the kids, especially on his wife. I think it makes sense that he is an alcoholic dad and he does have his son in Pisces in the third house. That's literally couldn't be more alcoholism. Pisces is a water sign. Pisces rules drugs. And the third house rules um, everything mental. He also has this grand trine in water. A lot of times we think in astrology that grand trine is just so positive, so always yes, always thumbs up, always great. But you have to just think about that. The only thing a trine really is, is saying that your brain kind of connects these things and says, yes, they work together well. That doesn't mean that 
what comes out is something that's positive or negative. It just means that these energies flow and they reinforce each other. Sometimes they can reinforce positive good things and sometimes they can reinforce negative things. So let's say you have a very unhinged planet um, in a very unhinged sign and house and it only has good aspects. You'd think, oh, well, this planet is so positive and so healthy, but in reality, maybe it's just reinforcing all those negative characteristics of that planet. There's no square opposition kind of forcing it to see the other side forcing something else to come out of that planet and it can just sit in its own slime basically and be fine with it sometimes. So with Richard Ramirez's Grand Trine it's in water and it's combining his Pisces Sun in the third house, his Neptune in Scorpio in the 11th house, and his Lilith in Cancer in the seventh house. I am an astrologer that mostly uses the true Lilith over the mean Lilith. And also at the tip of this is his Sun opposite Pluto. I think this is a big recipe for him being a serial killer and him having a lot of that negative abusive influence from a young age. Okay, this is like a really controversial thing to say, but I think it makes sense upon the fact that he's like an incredibly controversial character as he should be. Um, but I think that Lilith in Cancer in the seventh house represents his mother, obviously, and his he did not see his mother as a very positive figure because it's Lilith. He saw his mother as a very probably like emotionally manipulative figure or just neglectful or just in whatever way he saw her as a bad mom and a lot of times Lilith in the seventh house can honestly sometimes revel in seeing people get hurt sometimes physically sometimes emotionally sometimes you know intellectually but with his Lilith in the seventh house I think there was a part of him that liked to see his mom or even maybe his female siblings get abused growing up or maybe just in general he just liked seeing that abuse from a young age with all that intercepted Aquarius energy was very detached from all of it and definitely internalized a lot of it with that intercepted Mars which I'll get into later um, that came out in a lot of unhealthy ways and this Mars and conjunct Pluto that also adds to all of this with that grand trying touching that Neptune and that Sun I think that points to his dad's alcoholism and then on the other side with that Lilith his dad's abuse and then with that Sun opposite Pluto it being toward painted towards him and him and his power being taken away from a young age it was almost like that grand trine made him want to continue the pattern that his dad showed him because his dad maybe went back and forth with that sun opposite Pluto. I feel like that grand trine actually enforced him continuing and even amplifying that pattern that his dad showed him at a very young age and it was almost like he met minimal resistance with it. It's a flowing grand trine. He has an opposition, but it's not a kite pattern. And so it was like, okay, nobody really stopped him. He was able to get away with it and continue bad behavior. It wasn't really stopped. It wasn't really taught differently, um, I think is how this showed. Also with his dad having fits of rage, it makes sense that Richard Ramirez has an intercepted Mars. Um, he probably wasn't really able to talk back to his dad, you know, say anything, um, you know, and be like, hey, I don't like that you're hitting me. I'm sure he just got beat more and he found that the best thing to do is to, you know, not really be seen, you know, intercepted Venus, intercepted Leo, not really be heard, intercepted Mars, and even intercepted Aquarius don't really stand out amongst the pack just kind of blend in because you'll probably get less beatings you'll be you know less abused if you do so so that was probably emphasized in his chart as well also I will say with this Pisces and all this Neptune energy in his chart he does represent something of the collective unconscious and what was going on during that time especially well this is getting ahead of itself but while he was murdering in the mid 80s this is I feel like the height of serial killer time and a lot of them had Neptune and Scorpio and and I think that makes a lot of sense within serial killers. There was this real fear around anybody could be killed, Neptune and Scorpio, and nobody is safe. We used to think safety was guaranteed and we can keep our doors unlocked. But with Neptune and Scorpio, that was like shattered and people realized that they weren't safe anymore. All of his Neptune and Scorpio energy in the 11th house, that's again, the collective unconscious times a billion with that Scorpio. It's just, he really is tapped into this thing where he almost is the serial killer, serial killer. <laughs> I'll keep bringing in the round. With it trying the sun, it was like, that's what he was almost brought upon this world to do, and that's all he did. Yeah, and it, it's almost like his chart, if I'm being honest, doesn't have any more depth than that. I'm getting really ahead of myself. Also, something else that you may be like, oh my god, 
Shayna, I have Lilith in the seventh house and like I don't like seeing people get hurt like at all. Like that makes me really upset. That can be very valid, right? I'm not trying again, blah, blah, blah. Um, but something that I think also further contributed to this is his Mars aspects of Mars sextile moon and Mars in conjunct Pluto. Now Mars in conjunct Pluto obviously is one that points to a bunch of abuse and power and fits and rage and all that sort of stuff. Um, but also moon sextile Mars, I think contributed to the fact that he liked this violence. There's a part of him that got along with this kind of almost chaos in his everyday life that's also very Uranian and Aquarian. That kind of propelled him to almost find comfort in it, I think. Moon square Mars, you see abuse in the female and you hate it and you don't like it. And you may be like, when I was a kid, I couldn't stand up for my mom, but when I'm older, I'm gonna stand up for females everywhere, um, whatever, you know what I mean? To become an advocate in that way. Um, with moon sextile Mars, maybe he was like, nah, you know, I am sexist, fuck women, I don't like women, they should be beat how my um, dad beat my mom and I'm actually okay with that. So as much as we think like moon sextile Mars, I would think there's normally a very positive aspect in a very wicked chart. Um, I think it can point towards he liked seeing all that stuff. Also with his dad being an alcoholic, I think this really points to this Venus opposite Uranus and his Venus intercepted in Aquarius. This is a super detached Venus, um, not connected at all, did not receive much love, did not receive much nurture. Um, and I think that can be shown through, um, first of all, it said a lot that his parents were very distant. They worked a lot, right? Venus opposite Uranus, they're somewhere distant. Venus intercepted, there's too many kids. He didn't probably get any personalized, individualized attention and love. And Venus in Aquarius, the way that the love was given when it was around is probably pretty much um, non-existent. Uh, maybe the dad troted around that he was better than the rest of the family and that was how the love was given was, you know, you had to give dad love and tell him he's great. Maybe there was some narcissism there or something. I don't know. I don't know that family that personally. <laughs> Um, but yes, with Venus opposite Uranus and an alcoholic's um, love kind of going back and forth and that being kind of broken from a young age, it makes a lot of sense that there's not really um, much warmth and much love and much also desire for connection in his chart. There's really, in fact, desire for disconnection. Um, and a lot of it in his chart. Even though we think of Pisces as wanting to merge, I think that his want to merge was just that want to like cause harm, kill, murder, uh, rape, all that sort of stuff and have that affect you emotionally. Because you have to remember his only cancer planet is Lilith. So he has this negative view of, ca of cancer. <sighs> Oh, I'm going so far into everything. But yeah, Venus opposite Uranus, very cold, okay. And then obviously his fourth house is in Aries. So it's not just that, you know, he has to take care of himself, but also there's a lot of um, physical abuse in the home, which is very Aries fourth house, like super Aries fourth house. Um, very literal. There's also this really interesting story where his mother worked at a boot factory and she was exposed to a lot of harsh chemicals that at that time were not known to cause birth defects, but later on found out did. So all five children were born with different birth defects because she was pregnant while she was working in this factory. Um, and it's also interesting that it was specifically a boot factory because he is a Pisces sun, moon, and mercury. And the part of the body that Pisces rules is the feet. And that will also come into play a lot later. Um, so you know, shoes and the feet <laughs> um, kind of thing. Also, I think it's interesting that he has the second house Chiron. Chiron is the wound and he was wounded by his mom working at the boot factory. Um, second house Chiron in Aquarius. And the second house is the things that you make. Um, you know, she made boots and she worked at a factory and he was wounded by the fact that she did that. And that was a perpetual wound and there's not, it was not his fault. He was just born into that defect. So he began smoking weed and drinking really early at age 10, which makes sense because he has the Sagittarius rising, which is, very much like, oh, Sagittarius can have this mentality of you put something in my hand and I'll take it. You know, Sagittarius, Jupiter in the first house as well, even further emphasizes that point. Um, and then all that Pisces energy is also very prone to substances as well. And especially with the fact that he was exposed to this in his young childhood because all of his Pisces energy is in his third house of youth and he started smoking and drinking at age 10. Makes sense. Now, something else that I would like to point out is that like Ted Kaczynski, 
he has the same chart ruler as he has his final dispositor and that energy is in its home sign so basically what i'm trying to say is um ted kaczynski is a gemini rising and then his chart ruler is his mercury and his Mercury is in Gemini, and his final dispositor is his Mercury in Gemini, and then this planet Mercury rules the sign of Gemini. The same goes for Richard Ramirez, um, but it's just with Sagittarius and Jupiter. He's a Sagittarius rising. His chart ruler is his Sagittarius Jupiter in his first house. His final dispositor is, again, Sagittarius rising, go to Jupiter in Sagittarius, and his Jupiter is in the ruling planet of Sagittarius. Okay, <laughs> so um, I don't know what all that means. Uh, maybe it just makes it so that that is just such a potent energy and because it is a mutable energy and it is Mercury and Jupiter and they both can be nefarious in their own different ways that it just lets that energy run really wild, um, perhaps. That's the only thing that I can point to that, but I find it interesting. So if you have any comments about that, you should let me know. Also, it's said that Ramirez was knocked unconscious and almost died on multiple occasions before he was six years old and as a result later developed temporal lobe epilepsy aggressivity and hypersexuality i guess at age two a dresser fell on his head and at age five he was knocked unconscious after falling from a swing so again, a lot of times it's mentioned with serial killers that there's some sort of head trauma. I think that makes sense in astrology with Aries ruling the head and Aries just being very impulsive, very angry. Now, it's not going to be an Aries that is a serial killer, but it makes sense that serial killers will have very strong Mars energy or very strong Aries energy. So it makes sense that Richard Ramirez has Aries in his fourth house with all of these head accidents happening. Now, it also pointed to hypersexuality. I think this is obviously shown in the fact that he does have Aries in the fourth house but I think it's I don't think it's as simple as that if somebody just had Aries in the fourth house I don't think that would guarantee hypersexuality um, although it can definitely point to it it can also point to like hyper masculinity or hyper aggressiveness as well now with hypersexuality I found it interesting because I was like he has an intercepted Mars which you usually don't think of as hypersexual you kind of think of it as the opposite which I will get into later where that comes into play but also with Aquarius there's usually you know a little bit more more of a detachment so they can sometimes be hypersexual because what's interesting I've been watching a lot of Trisha Paytas all of a sudden again and she has a Mars and Aquarius I was listening to her tell a story and I realized that her hypersexuality came from the fact that she doesn't care one way or another and she thinks that there must be something wrong with her because of that and what I mean by that is that she was telling a story where she was like oh I was working at this cafe or something and she was serving this semi-famous person and just in front of him and their and the whole entourage she just had sex with them. Uh, I don't know if this is a true story or not, but let's just say it is for the sake of this um, anecdote. When she was explaining why it was wrong, she was more saying that she felt like it was not the right thing to do because that's not something that normal people do. That's not something that you should be doing. That's not a normal behavior, even though she said that it felt very normal to her and it's not that she didn't want to. It just was a thing. It wasn't as big of a deal, I think, to her. And I think so maybe some of that is Richard Ramirez where... Um, he kind of is on the masculine side of that and that's where his hypersexuality comes from. So this is really touchy to talk about and I just kind of skated over it and I'll probably make it worse by explaining it. So what I mean by Richard Ramirez's Aquarius Mars being on the masculine side of the example of Trisha Paytas's feminine Aquarius Mars is that when you're a biological female and your just automatic act is receiving, when she is receiving in sex, she's very like, oh, I guess this is just what's gonna happen. And there can be a major disconnect there. And so I think that while well, on the masculine end of that, Richard Ramirez is, can go a lot more sinister and the feminine side can go a lot more sinister there can be very positive i'm aside to masculine aquarius mars i'm not somebody that's anti aquarius mars placements i'm just kind of explaining where i think this nature comes from i think every mars sign can be nefarious but basically with richard ramirez because his biological sex is male so he's you know giving i guess with aquarius mars there's a disconnect to who he's doing it with i think and so he just kind of wants to do it with anybody and there's a real disconnect and a lack of empathy there for if he's hurting somebody for if he's doing something that the other person doesn't want to do i'm like trisha paytas doesn't really care one way or another what's being done to her it's almost like richard ramirez doesn't care one way or another what he's doing to the other 
person um, is kind of what I mean by that. I'm also not trying to at all imply that Trisha Paytas has ever done anything wrong. I don't know her life. I was just trying to use this as an example. Um, so hopefully that made sense. And I also think it comes from Mars in conjunct Pluto as well as Mars square Neptune and all of these like hyper fantasies. Mars square Neptune is like having all of these fantasies that never, no matter what you do, are able to be played out sufficiently. And this can cause a lot of frustration, um, which is obviously shown through his rapes that he did. But I also would like to rethink Mars in the second house because I've never thought much about this placement one way or another, even though I've had people in my life with this placement. But after kind of coming realizing that Ted Kaczynski also had this placement. I was wondering if this is actually a lot more of an aggressive and dangerous position than we kind of normally think about and I'm like kind of looking twice at this placement because I think that there can be a lot of anger in Taurus. The second house is ruled by Taurus and when you get the bull angry it charges at you head first and there's no stopping it. It's also a fixed house and so it's very stubborn and it wants its way and it can maybe want its way sexually. I usually see Mars and Taurus as very like soft and sweet in the bedroom and very sensual, you know, kind of even sometimes a little bit lazy and lackadaisical. But I wonder if Mars in the second house is more of this um, demanding placement, this demanding side of like, this is what I want, I'm stubborn, um, as well as it being possessive because it's the things that it owns. So it's like, I own you, I own your body, I own this person's body. And it's like, they just want to own all all these things and own all these people's bodies as well when Mars is in there, um, which can have to do maybe with that hypersexuality that he has that's also seen in Mars and the second house people. So uh, I don't know if you have this placement or somebody you know this placement, let me know. Another big thing that a lot of people said was a big influence as to why Richard Ramirez turned out the way he was. He started getting closer to his older cousin Miguel. Miguel was a decorated Green Beret and he'd already been to the Vietnam War and back. He had taken all these pictures of all these Vietnam women that he had brutally murdered and raped and abused. You know, he had all this kind of sort of um, memorabilia from his time in Vietnam and then he was showing it to Richard Ramirez at a young age and it was very grotesque especially like sexually explicit things so this was very influential upon him and his sexuality being formed and I think that also the fact that he had this influence from this older cousin that went to the Vietnam War and introduced him to all this very plutonic stuff is shown by his Pluto in the ninth house especially because the ninth house rules extended family something like cousins especially an older cousin war especially having to do with Pluto and all this abuse and this all this stuff and this being this big influence and also around this time is when he started getting into Satanism which also shows up heavily with Pluto in the ninth house and being being interested in the more demonic side of things, being interested in belief systems that are darker. I also think that is Uranus in the eighth house being intercepted shows up in this experience as well, because there can be with Uranus in the eighth house, a major disconnection to trauma and suffering, as well as a major disconnection to your own deep emotions. You can have a very um, monotone way of dealing with things and a monotone reaction to things that can startle a lot of people and confuse a lot of people. And he definitely shows this as well. So Richard was 13 when he witnessed his older cousin Miguel shoot his wife Jessica and kill her. Richard Ramirez spoke to this and said that it didn't affect him in the traditional sense but it rather was a source of fascination for him which is exactly that Uranus in the eighth house thing I was talking about. And Miguel was actually found not guilty by case of insanity and he was released four years later. Um, and I think this also showed that Sagittarius Jupiter in the first house influence that Richard Ramirez has that says that you can get away with things. I think that it was very important that he got um, only four years and that was it from killing his wife. And I think it was just like he was in like a mental facility even. I don't even know if he was in prison, but I think that that showed that, oh, I can get away with this. Oh, um, you just have to, you know, have this charisma. You just have to be said that you're insane and then you're all good to go, which is very Sagittarius Jupiter in the first house as well as all that Pisces stuff. So that was kind of, I think, early conditioning. By the time he was 14, he had already become a peeping Tom he was using LSD regularly, which is incredibly Pisces energy, you know, that's very psychedelic, trippy nature. Now, thievery was something that definitely colored 
his life always from beginning to end. Um, he was always a thief. And I think this is shown by this Mars in the second house and this Chiron in the second house. This Chiron in the second house, he was mad. He didn't have anything. He felt this wound. He had to go steal for himself, you know, fourth house Aries. And then with that Mars in the second house, it's kind of going like, this is mine. This object is mine. I take this. I get this. It was intercepted from me. This wasn't given to me. So I'm, so why can't I just take it? Why can't I just grab it? That kind of entitlement. Now his first actual conviction was in 1976 and it was for marijuana possession and petty crimes and he went to juvenile detention which I think is shown through that third house kind of Pisces energy but this does set that early kind of thing with incarceration and I think Pisces in the 12th house rules incarceration and with all this Pisces energy it makes sense that he spent a lot of his life in incarceration and this started from a young age. So he actually dropped out of high school in the ninth grade which is again very Pisces in the third house especially that debilitated Pisces Mercury in the third house square a bunch of stuff um he just has no interest in school no sixth house energy he just kind of wants to do his own thing and expand his mind more through the use of psychedelics drugs and also sex so now that we kind of understand where Richard Ramirez came from, family with five kids, Mexican immigrant family, lower working class, some neglect, lots of alcoholic abuse, um, lots of violence and anger and aggression and you know, very early on showing a lot of abuse towards women. All of this is very much a recipe for his crimes. Now I will say, obviously, if you experienced a life very similar to Richard Ramirez, that doesn't mean that you're going to become a serial killer, especially like he has four other siblings and they're not. There's diff different ways that things express themselves and everybody has a different birth chart and whatever. If you're not a serial killer, you're not and you know that and that's all the confirmation you need. But he is, so let's talk about him. Okay. <laughs> So in 1982, at the age of 22, he moved and settled permanently in California from Texas. Now he was nomadically living between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Also, that kind of makes sense with that third house energy kind of living back and forth between two places that are within the same state, but um, you know, not the same city. That's very third house. It was also around this time that he started to use cocaine a lot more um, and drugs and alcohol in general, but also especially cocaine. Um, now I I honestly directly link cocaine to Sagittarius and Jupiter, um, but especially the sign of Sagittarius. He is a 22 degree Sagittarius rising, which is the kill or be killed degree, which <laughs> interesting, right? I don't know. When I think of cocaine, I think of just like people sitting around a table, just like being like, oh, it's just my idea for my next big project. And let me talk about myself and let me stand up and be the tallest person in the room and be the loudest person in the room. And did you know that I have the most money? And did you know that I have the most flashiest things? And did you know that I talk the loudest you know what I mean and that's just like kind of that nasty Sagittarius energy but he also had double Gemini double Sagittarius to make up for his interception so he probably felt like he didn't really have much of an identity again the serial killer serial killer but he probably found that through the things that he thought and the things that he says and when you do cocaine you think a lot more and you say a lot more well I should say you think less but you definitely talk a lot more so cocaine probably made him kind of find his identity honestly a little bit in who he was was. And it also caused him to, you know, lower his, his inhibitions more because he's on drugs. Um, I just think of it as, as chatty, you know what I mean? And he has all this third house stuff. So I think that also makes sense that he just kind of wants to talk and do cocaine and kind of be up all the time, which is very Sagittarius. I think that LSD was more of that Pisces phase. Now, most of his crimes that we know of take place in Los Angeles. And so I wanted to put up Richard Ramirez's birth chart with Los Angeles's birth chart and see if anything struck out to me. Richard Ramirez's Mars, Venus, Chiron, and Ceres is in the fourth house, so it makes sense that this was kind of where he settled. This is where he found his home, um, but also this is where he caused a lot of like damage and a lot of drama and a lot of trauma with that Chiron and Mars and stuff, but he enjoyed it with that Venus, I guess. I don't know, but it's activated. This is the place that he decided feels like home. His son, Mercury, and Moon are in the fifth house, which makes a lot of sense because this is what's fun for him. He probably had a lot of fun in LA. He got to steal a bunch of shit. He got to do a bunch of drugs you know cocaine is rampant in LA it probably it was even more during the 80s his midheaven falls in Los Angeles's 12th house which makes sense that he kind of 
came alive at night. I think of the 12th house ruling those kind of hours in the day where most people are asleep um, and in their like REM state and that's when he became the night stalker and so it makes sense that his midheaven is in Los Angeles's 12th house. Um, his presence really brought up a lot of subconscious fears of the Los Angeles residents. So his crime started out as thefts and burglaries. Again that second house stuff. Um, basically to get money to fund his coke addiction which is very Sagittarius energy and also he has an intercepted second house which means that he never really wanted to earn his own money. Um, either maybe he had an inheritance but since he didn't have an inheritance it was more that he inherited or borrowed stuff from the people he stole things from. But also it's very Aquarius as well. He has a sort of like entitlement like I'm owed this, I'm a god and I should just be able to take this which is that Aquarius kind of nature which he has a lot of but it's also intercepted and so it's ruled by Capricorn so he probably never got many things handed to him. It's Capricorn but he handed them to himself with his Venus in the second house. It was also mentioned that when he moved to LA he quickly started to neglect his hygiene which is just Pisces. Also it's noted that he had really bad teeth. The teeth is ruled by Saturn which would make sense that he had bad teeth because he has Saturn and Capricorn in the first house and whenever you have Saturn in your first house there's something that makes you self-conscious about the way you look and so it makes sense that it's his teeth. And it's also square is midheaven which is Liz Libra midheaven so he really does care about his appearance and how like charming and charismatic he is and so it probably did bother him. A lot of maybe his personality maybe even came from the fact that like he didn't want to smile and show his teeth. I do know people like this and so they will like not smile they'll keep a straight face they won't talk as much which was very like Saturn in the first house demeanor also so maybe those two things kind of like bad teeth and then hiding it by being more serious is very like Saturn in the first house especially in Capricorn. All right so moving into his crime so his very first murder took place on March 17th 1985 in Rosemead California and the first victim was Dale Okazaki age 35 and she was found lying on the kitchen floor dead in her condo shot right in her forehead. Basically Richard Ramirez had snuck in. There was a tussle <laughs> that ensued and she was behind a counter and she looked over the counter to see where he was and Richard Ramirez was waiting for her and he made eye contact with her, saw the look in her eyes and then shot her right in the forehead and that's when she died. Now Maria Hernandez was Dale's roommate and she came home and she entered in through the garage door as this was happening. She heard a noise and she turned around and it was Richard Ramirez. He had made a noise and he went and he shot her. Well, she had a keys in her hand and she held them up over her face and the bullet deflected off of the key. It pushed her to the ground, all the force, but it never infiltrated any of her body. And so Richard Ramirez assumed she was dead, walked around her and walked back in the house. Um, she went around to the front of the condo and he was she was hoping that he'd come out the garage door, but instead he came out the front of the condo. And it was odd because he was shocked when he saw her, but he did not actually kill her. So I think this is the first showing of his Mars interception. There is a lot of showing of him being, as much as he's very scary and he wants to look in people's eyes when he kills them, he also is just as much a coward. Now I think it makes a lot of sense that he targets women based off of his Lilith and Cancer in the seventh house. What I also found interesting is that his first murder is actually in the middle of Pisces season. It happened at nearly the same degree of his natal moon. And now this will come into play later on. His next murder actually happened just a few hours after that, but it was technically the next day on March 18th in 1985 in Monterey Park. And it was 40 minutes after Dale's murder. The police get another call that the murder happened about a mile away from Dale. And it was a 30 year old name, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering this, Tai Lin Yu, basically driving, stopped and yanked from the car and then murdered right on the spot, which this was incredibly different to the other murder. The only similarity is the eye contact. He always wants to see the fear in people's eyes. Now, when I was trying to figure this out, it seems like Venus rules the eyes in astrology, but I'm not 100% sure. I mean, I guess it makes sense because, you know, 
they're the window to the soul or whatever and I guess that's like Venus I don't know but his Venus is conjunct as Mars and they're both trying his midheaven so I guess that would make sense with wanting intense eye contact with that Mars conjunction and that fear with Mars and then it trying the midheaven so it making that kind of external point of reference of wanting that intense um, eye contact before the final blow um, but that's the best I um, kind of comparison I could make if you have any ideas let me know in the comments his next murder happened a few days later on March 27th in 1985 um, this was actually when the moon was in Gemini in his seventh house and this was actually a double murder which makes sense that it was Gemini it was a couple he ransacked the place stole a bunch of shit you know again his Mars and his second house stuff um, and he killed a man that was 64 named Vincent Zazara and he died with a gunshot wound to the temple after Richard killed Vincent he went and he killed Maxine Zazara who was 44 which was his um, partner she was found dead she had several stab wounds she was raped and she had her eyes cut out again with the eyes thing the main clue that was made through this murder is that it linked all three of them together because in all three murders a 22 was used that was the gun that was used now I think it's really interesting, everybody's gonna hate me for saying this one, that he has a 22 degree Sagittarius rising. Now 22 is a very strong degree. It's the kill or be killed degree. And with him, this was honestly very literal. I think this shows in the fact that he was abused and then he decided to ab continue to abuse basically. That's kind of like the kill or be killed nature, but also 22 degrees and then a 22 gun was used. And then he also has a 22 degree mean Lilith in Gemini and there was a 22 degree Gemini moon that night. Um, so yeah, Sagittarius Gemini 22, all very interesting. Hmm, okay. Now we're obviously talking a lot about rape because he is a serial rapist. Um, now this is obviously a very delicate subject and I don't want to insinuate anything of anybody's chart, but it is a big reason as to why I want to do this series. Like, can you find rapists? in astrology like I don't know what are common themes what is it is it what we expect I do still want to open up the discussion um but please only talk about like I guess only talk about like known confirmed rapists like Richard Ramirez is a known confirmed rapist what I think this points to is as I've mentioned Lilith in the seventh house creates a sort of distaste for people um, now sometimes this can just translate into somebody that turns into a loner and just doesn't really want anything to do with people just you know maybe they own their own business they work alone they're a hermit even you know or they just don't have many friends and they just have a small circle even um, or this can go to a very intense hatred bitterness envy distaste this kind of feeling that like people aren't inherently good and so almost like I can do bad things to them I think kind of is a little bit the justification he also has an intercepted eighth house so there isn't as much of a want to merge with other people um again this is shown through that intercepted Venus there really isn't a want to connect to other people he doesn't really like people he feels very separate very exiled to them and there's nothing in his chart that shows that he wants this deep sort of connection except for that Pisces energy again which I think is what makes him not be a hermit and which makes him go out and kill and rape because that is almost like that's the connection he's looking for and now after these rapes and murders of these older women there were a series of child abductions and sexual assaults in the area around Pisces season again they're all about you know six to eight years old now I see an interest in children through a lot of times thwarted Gemini energy um, especially in the seventh house and you will see that he does have Gemini in the seventh house now I'm not going to sit here and say that every Sagittarius rising is interested in children but I will sit here and say that I do think that Sagittarius risings are interested in youth and youthful energy um, and sometimes that can cause a predisposition towards um, being interested in children and it is a mutable energy it does have less rules um, instilled into it naturally and also with that l mean Lilith in Gemini in the seventh house in there I think this does point towards 
this want of kids, this want to rape kids, and this conscious will to do it. So the other thing, other than this 22 caliber gun that connected these crimes together, was a shoe print. There was a shoe print found at almost all of the crime scenes, and it was an Avia shoe print. This was a really rare shoe, and especially in the size that the shoe was, there was only one in that color, type, and size that was distributed to LA, but they couldn't trace it any farther than that. Now, I think it's really interesting that he is a Pisces sun, moon, and Mercury, which rules the feet. It was the shoe print that connected everything. His mom worked at the boot factory. So before this shoe print was found, nobody actually believed that this was the same person because the demographic for the molestations, rapes, murders, abductions, it's all so different and it's all so random, which again connects to Aquarius. He has this Venus and Mars conjunction in Aquarius trying his midheaven. And so it helped him out because it made it so that he was harder to track because he was unpredictable. On May 29th, 1985, he murders again. This time, Mabel Bell and Florence Bell, which are two sisters in their 80s. So again, a very big age jump from age six to age 80. Um, Very Venus and Aquarius. Like there's not really a common thread of what a Venus and Aquarius is attracted to. Um, It's kind of a little bit of everything that's also very Sagittarius. Again, he entered through an unlocked rear door at night. He sexually assaulted them. He did other very gruesome things. Florence was honestly barely alive. Um, there was again another shoe print found. He also took time to have a Mountain Dew banana and a snack after killing them, which is a very common theme throughout his murders. People with Venus in the second house like have like comfort foods, <laughs> honestly, that they like need to kind of take a break after they do something and reward themselves with. You know, sometimes it can be a cigarette, sometimes it can be a drink, sometimes it can be this or that, but a lot of times for Venus in the second house, it's like a soda or a snack or um, like some kind of food thing. He was known for taking Mountain Dew. Like that was probably his like Venus in the second house indulgence. Also, this was the first time that we saw the Satan thing like written on a wall in connection to him, which, you know, that whole Satan thing shows in it's like Mars in conjunct Pluto and Pluto in the ninth house thing, as I mentioned. But also um, when you think about what Satan really is, all Satan really is, is an adversary. It's a metaphor or a myth for an adversary. Really enough, if you look up Satan's birth chart on Astro theme, which it's bullshit, but whatever, you can do that. Everything's in Aquarius, um, which is interesting. Richard Ramirez does have a bunch of stuff in Aquarius and Saturn in the first house in Capricorn definitely shows um, somebody who looks like the devil appears like the devil just because he does have all of this Pisces energy. So he does kind of create himself to be a religious symbol. And with the Aquarius Sagittarius energy as well, it makes sense that that symbol is that of an adversary just to be an adversary's sake, especially with that Venus and Aquarius, but opposite to Uranus. It's not for any reason. He doesn't do this for any reason. It's just a compulsion. It just is because it is. He's just the serial killer, serial killer, you know? Some more murders that he committed without being caught, which also just shows how completely like unadept the Los Angeles County police system is, as we know. But on June 28th, 1985, he murdered Patty Higgins, which was 32 years old. Four days later, he murdered Mary Cannon, um, who was aged 75, a few miles down from that. On July 5th, there was another murder of a 16 year old. And on July 6, there was a double murder of Lorraine and John Rodriguez. Basically, a handful of victims actually survived his murders and they were able to say what he looked like. And I think this has a lot to do with, again, the mutability of the lack of being careful that he kind of wanted them to see his face, but also that Mars intercepted, which can point to cowardice. There was a story of him shooting somebody in the head and them kind of like not fully being dead from it and them like coming back to life and them just like dragging their like decrepit body towards Richard Ramirez and him freaking out and like running away. Um, so there was definitely a lot of people that called him very much a coward. He was very scared, which I think again shows that intercepted Mars. On July 7th, there was another murder and basically this was just happening so frequently and so almost like commonly that it really, he made it feel like anybody 
anybody could be a victim, which is that Neptune in the 11th house in Scorpio. The only thing that's common thread is this third house thing of it happening in the Los Angeles County area and it being at night. That's the only common thread. Basically within the next 10 days, there were five new cases and they were trying to keep a lot of the information really private because basically the only evidence they had right now was a shoe print. He didn't leave any DNA around. He didn't need to leave any fingerprints. Um, they just had this via shoe print, which they could do nothing else with. And if he changed his shoes because he found out that they knew about the shoe print, then they'd be screwed. That's the only thing they had. So they had to keep things very, very quiet. Again, Neptune in the 11th house, very elusive. Neptune and Scorpio, very secretive. It's not until after all these cases that these different news outlets start coining different names for him. So KNBC named him the walk-in killer. Another outlet called him the Valley Intruder. And the one that stuck was the one that the Herald Examiner gave him, which was the Night Stalker, which is what we know him as today. I think it makes sense that he was first only known as this elusive, scary figure known as the Night Stalker, which is very Neptune in the 11th house in Scorpio, as I keep on mentioning. Also, try in the sun. So he really identified with the Night Stalker. He actually really liked this name, and it was said that he wound up calling himself this to his later victims. Um, so he got a lot of confidence and it was almost like a pat on the back for him because of the sun trying Neptune when they gave him this name. With this Neptune trying Lilith, it's the stalker. You know, Lilith in the seventh house, somebody that stalks, somebody that's obsessive, somebody that comes in at night. Also, I would like to point out that Richard Ramirez does have a nighttime chart because his sun is located below the horizon line. It's in the third house. He was born at night as well. And Pisces also is very much the ruler of nighttime. You know, it's the moon card in the tarot. It rules that kind of in-between hidden realm and so it makes sense that he lives most of his life in this nighttime elusive um, period and he's known as the night stalker Neptune trying Lilith trying the sun. On August 18th he actually moved to San Francisco and somebody named Peter Pan was shot. Um, I think it's interesting that he murdered somebody named Peter Pan because he does kind of live this life of like no responsibility. He, you know he's doing all the drugs he wants. He's stealing so much money and jewelry from everybody he murders. He's getting away with all these crimes. He, you know, he's basically living by no rules, the most like extreme kind of Peter Pan syndrome. And then he murders somebody named Peter Pan. And that is kind of when things change. It's kind of like his innocence kind of drops. So on August 27th, 1985, which is day 163 of his crime spree, the police department receives a tip from a female and she said that her father was basically a homeless or a street person and that he knew and was close friends with an individual named Rick and that her father thought that Rick might be the night stalker. They know that Rick is from El Paso and this Rick had even told the father about a murder that he had committed in Monterey Park with a 22 semi-automatic pistol. Rick told the man that he had taken the gun to Tijuana and sold it to somebody and basically the police said that we are going to take this man to Tijuana to try to recover this gun. Now, the LAPD was kind of fumbling around with this and they weren't getting to the point and San Francisco was over it. This guy winds up surrendering this bracelet that he got from his mom in San Pablo, California. His mom got her bracelet from her boyfriend, who got it from a friend from El Paso, who is known as Rick. So the boyfriend's name is Armando, and the San Francisco police guy goes to Armando, goes to his house, and confronts him. And he says, you have to help me break this Night Stalker case. When he heard this, Armando's tone immediately changed, and he was like, I am not the Night Stalker. I am not helping you. I want nothing to do with this. And he tries to walk away from the car and walk away from the police officer. The police officer says, hell no. And he forces Armando into the car. They basically get into a slight altercation and the police officer literally slaps Armando really hard in the face. It gets even nastier and the police officer goes like this to punch him even harder again. And that's when Armando freaks out, winces and says, Richard Ramirez, his name is Richard Ramirez. And that is how we find out <laughs> Richard Ramirez is the Night Stalker. Is that legal? I don't think so, but San Francisco had one murder and they figured it out and LA had like 13 and they knew nothing, so.
They have the name Richard Ramirez. So they have a fingerprint of the Night Stalkers that they found on a car that he stole. And then they also have Richard Ramirez's fingerprint from the time that he stole a car and he got caught. And so they match up these two fingerprints, the Night Stalker one and the Richard Ramirez one, and they are a match. And so they have their serial killer. Now that they know that the Night Stalker is Richard Ramirez, they blast this on newspapers everywhere. Everybody has his mugshot from his prior stolen car arrest. You know, everybody knows his name now. Everybody in the LA County is looking for him. So on August 31st, 1985, which is day 167 of Richard Ramirez's crime spree, they know that Richard Ramirez is coming back from Arizona on a Greyhound bus because Richard Ramirez has visited, I think, a sibling in Arizona and was coming back from staying with them that day. So the police set up surveillance all around the area. Richard Ramirez got off the Greyhound bus and immediately recognized that something was up. He did not go out the normal way. He went around the back and he avoided everyone. So he winds up going into this liquor store and the first thing he sees in the liquor store is a newspaper with his picture on the front page. He sees it, he freaks out, he leaves the liquor store and he runs down Olympic and get as far away from the area as possible. And so basically the chase is on. He runs northeast and ends up on a street called Called Indiana. So he tries to carjack somebody, but they instantly recognize him and they do not let him do it. Then he tries to carjack somebody else and they recognize him again. And he actually winds up getting hit in the head with a metal iron from a civilian that recognized him. Also, again, hit on the head, Aries fourth house that goes all around, huh? And basically all these civilians come and they kind of are the one to get him and arrest him, which is so third house. That's the most third house thing ever for the community to arrest him. The sheriff car comes down the street, the cops handcuff him and they take him in the car. Now what I think is very interesting is that on this day exactly, the day that he was apprehended was at another 22 degree Pisces moon. The exact same sign as his first initial murder. And what's also even more interesting is that his progress chart during June, July, and August of 1985, he is a progressed Pisces moon. He is completing his lunar return. Now, when Richard Ramirez is taken in by the cops, immediately he is getting a certain level of attention. Now, obviously there's a ton of people that wanna beat him up and wanna see him dead and just wanna get their hands on him and rightfully so get justice. But there's also this group of women that are in instantly taken and instantly attracted to him. When they take Richard Ramirez into booking, there's this woman that unbuttons her shirt and flashes her boobs right at Richard Ramirez and like blows him a kiss. <laughs> he has a Libra Midheaven. It's the most Libra Midheaven response ever, even though he has this moon opposition in the third house in Pisces and he did all these horrible, heinous things. And all these women who are, you know, being all sexual towards him could have just have easily been his victim. They're still so sexualizing him and they still see him as attractive and they still see him as hot. Libra Midheaven, Shrine, Aquarius, Venus, and Mars. Like he has such a strong sexual appeal. He has such a strong attraction to him even if people know he's, you know, evil or whatever you judge him as, which, yeah. The trial began on October 24th, 1985. It's interesting because this happened in early Scorpio season with the Scorpio sign falling in his 10th house of public attention. This is when he was in the news the most, his picture, his face. He was known as Richard Ramirez. It wasn't just him being elusive as the Night Stalker. Also, I will say in his progress chart, he does have a progressed Scorpio midheaven, which makes sense that, you know, he's seen as this villain and this evil character and this very satanic figure as as well. He even got a satanic tattoo in prison, the infamous one on the hand, which I think is very much represented by his mean Lilith in Gemini in the seventh house. You remember that Gemini represents the hands, tattoo, Lilith, you know, the Satan thing, which is also very Lilith. During the trial, he decided to plead not guilty and he even murmured a very weak hail Satan as he left the courtroom. Now, I think a lot of this stuff is honestly a lot more for show and because, oh, you put me in the adversary position, so I'm going to be that. 
you know, ooh, ooga booga, spooky dookie dookie. I think he's just kind of like scaring people. I don't think he has any connection really to Satanism and he's just using it and exploiting it. This was also, you know, during the Satanic Panic. He got sent a lot of nudes and a lot of like very alluring messages from women all during the trial. He was always playing a game, which is very Sagittarius and Libra, especially in the courtroom. He was known for kind of acting out doing mischievous antics you know no pisces sagittarius person is really going to take anything that seriously he's even mentioned in a later interview that he just didn't really care what happened to him i think that's the bottom line he just with all that pisces energy and that sagittarius carefree nature he just doesn't really care much what happens to him and the consequences of his actions or how he affects people he also has this venus and mars square his neptune which have a lot to do i think that venus square neptune especially has a lot to do with like women um being very infantilized with him and you know sending them all these pictures and you know i'm sure there's a bunch of tumblr blogs dedicated to richard ramirez or whatever it may be they recovered so much evidence from the things that he stole and that's what wound up connecting him to so many of the crimes which again is his second house chiron that is his wound because he stole all these things and so he could put be put at the place of the crime. So even though his trial started in 1985, it wasn't until January 31st, 1989 that his trial finally came to a conclusion. So he was found guilty for more than 43 crimes, 13 murders, multiple robberies, rapes, and more. There were over 140 witnesses, and this didn't even include the child molestation cases because they just didn't want to put the children through that. But it wasn't until September 20th of 1989 that he was finally found guilty of all of his charges, all 43 crimes. I think the fact that he was actually charged for his crimes is his Saturn square, his midheaven. He did get away with it for quite some time, I'm not Sagittarius Jupiter in the first house, but his Saturn in Capricorn in the first house square, his Libra Midheaven, which is very lucky, very beneficial, very charming, didn't save him. His Saturn in the first house made him guilty. So on November 7th, 1989, he was sentenced to death in the gas chamber. And he was quoted for infamously saying as he was taken away, I'll see you in Disneyland, which is just the most Piscean, Neptunian, sarcastic quote for him to say. I've always said that Pisces rules Disneyland and people with Pisces influence love Disneyland. And he'd always said to his family that he was gonna take everyone to Disneyland. And then when he gets charged for 13 murders, 43 crimes, and he gets put to death. He sarcastically, jokingly says with his Sagittarius rising, I'll see you in Disneyland, Piscean Neptune, you know? After the trial, after the crimes, after everything has settled down, he was sent to San Quentin State Prison. And this is where he spent the rest of his life. He spent his life on death row. Now, what's interesting is that he actually never got his death date. He actually died of cancer on June 13th, 2013. He spent more than two decades on death row, which if you know anything about death row, you know that it's actually nicer than the regular prison. He was scheduled to die, but then he never did because I guess it took them so long for the execution. I don't know, which is very intercepted eighth house now that I think about it. He also does have a very strong Neptunian influence, both positive and negative, just like Ted Kaczynski did, who also died of cancer in prison, which is really interesting. They both, I think, have Venus and Mars square Neptune. What's interesting is that during all of Richard Ramirez's crimes, like that period of time that he committed them, it was his first progressed lunar return in Pisces. And then when he died in prison of cancer, that happened during his second lunar return in Pisces. It feels very much like he was fated to be the serial killer, serial killer. So I watched some interviews of him, but unlike Ted Kaczynski, where it's, you know, so easy to find his writing, that's really what he's pushing with this Gemini energy. Richard Ramirez is not pushing anything. He doesn't have any sort of plan. He doesn't have any sort of goal. He doesn't have any sort of 
trying to be this or that or much of anything. He just is him. He has very few interviews, but when I watched the few ones that I could find, all of them are, you know, when he's on death row um, for two decades, he kind of just mumbles around and trails off. He doesn't really say anything. He just kind of says what I think are these universal concepts that everybody started to understand around the 80s that had not been put into consciousness until then. Because of this highly Piscean influence that he has. He's just kind of saying what people want to hear or what scares people, it seems like. It's kind of really boring to watch, honestly. He has this debilitated Mercury and he just kind of was the serial killer, serial killer, you know? Yeah, that's kind of how I wrap it up. I wanted to study Richard Ramirez because he's just such a typical case to me. He's not why I'm personally interested in true crime, but I did kind of want to dissect what are these fundamental things of a serial killer and I think he's a really good study of that. Also what I will say it's really interesting that I'll talk about in this video is that he actually has the same sun, moon, and rising as another prolific serial killer which is John Wayne Gacy who I do also want to talk about in the future as well. Thank you so much for watching. And if you have any further comments or insights that you kind of discovered as you went through this video about Richard Ramirez, I would absolutely love to hear them in the comments. Don't forget that I sell birth chart readings at shaynaemily.com. I have an astrology TikTok and I have a personal Instagram. All right, thank you so much for watching. Bye.